All right, so in our lecture, we posted this example problem for you to try to work through. And what I want to do now is provide a little demo about how you might work through this. So this really has two questions embedded in one. And just like we talked about in the videos that pertain to a Z score calculation, how there are particular values that you were going to identify and some value you were going to want to solve for, the exact same process applies here. So in this case, we have two different scenarios. Uh, and the scenario is first where we have a sample where we have just one person. So a sample size one, essentially what we could say is this is what? A z-score because it only belongs to one person. In another case, we have a sample of 25 people. So these are our two different problems. What's the probability that one, that's this problem, and 25, so we're solving for both of these, randomly selected college students would have an average debt less than 2,700. So what do we have and what do we need? Well, we have the population mean, which would be mu, and that mean is given as 3173. We have the population standard deviation, which would be sigma. That value is given as 1120. We have the sample mean, which is x bar. Now, in the case where this is just one person, we could call this just x. It's their score. Of course, if you got the average for one person, it would still be that score, right? But this x or x bar is 2700. Right, so sample size is n, and I'm going to just put these in as numbers so we can refer to them with calculations. So we have two problems where all the information is the same except what? Except for the fact that we have sample size changes. So then what we need to do is we need to get probabilities. Now, you could use my Excel calculator that I developed. So if you remember seeing that, I'll show you how to use it in a moment. First, I'm just going to walk through with the Excel basics. Second, I'll show you how to use that specific tool. So here, if we use just Excel's functions, we can do this two ways. We can obtain the z-score or z-test value, and then we can get a p-value from that z. Or because we are using Excel, we can actually go directly to getting the p-value for the score of x using the information that is given. So let's look at how that would work. All right, so... If we're going to go straight from X to P, so we how do we know it's a P? We know we want a P value because we are told, we're asked what the probability is, right? So what, what we want to find is a P value. That's often what we're going to be solving for in these problems nowadays. Okay, so we want to find this P value. Now, this P value is for having a value less than. So this is where we want what? Just the area to the left. So we're going to want the area left, which is going to be the tail of the distribution in this case. How do I know it's going to be the tail? I know it's going to be the tail, which means the smaller part of the distribution, because the score is below the mean. So if we're already below the mean and we want the area left, that's got to be the small part of the distribution, right? It has to be the small part, the tail. So you know that this p-value is going to have to be under 0.5, and you know it's going to be well under 0.5, right? Because the middle of your distribution is what? 0.5, right? Okay, so we want the p-value area left. It's going to be a tail value, so we want that p-value to be relatively small, certainly under 0.5. So how would we get this value? Well, we could use the Excel command norm.dist. When you do that, Excel asks you for four things. First, what is the value of x? All right, in this case, x is 2,700. Second, what is the mean? Mu, 3173. What is the standard deviation? Sigma, right? Cumulative, true. Now, if we do this, what does that do? Cumulative means everything up to this point, so it will get us the area to the left. And here is that value. So notice it's under 0.5, which we knew it should be. That means we know it is the tail. It's a small part of the distribution. So that is the value we would want. So there you go. That is the p-value, the probability of getting one student to have an average debt less than 2,700 given these parameters on the distribution. The probability is about 34% or 0.336. Okay? So what about the probability of getting 25 students whose average debt is 2,700? Well, we can use the exact same function, but we have to remember the difference now between a z-score and a z-test. So a z-test requires us to use the standard error, as we covered on the slide right before this problem. So the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. 
So let's put in these values. Our mean for the sample would be our X, 2700. The mean for the population, the standard deviation. This needs to be the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is the standard error. The standard error is sigma divided by the square root of n, the sample size. Okay? And then we would say cumulative, true. And there is the probability. So the probability of getting 25 students to have an average debt less than 2,700 is 0 0.017. That is, there is less than a 2% chance that 25 students would have an average debt this low. Ha ha, and we talked about this, which is less likely, meeting one person who's six foot seven or 25 people whose average height is six foot seven. And we knew that meeting 25 people whose average height is that tall is much less likely than just meeting one. And that's the same thing we're finding here. Yeah, you can find one student whose debt that is that low. That's not surprising at all. The p-value is 0.34, right? That tells you that one in three students could have a debt that low in this distribution. However, the idea of having 25 students whose average debt is that low, highly unlikely. So we would only, we'd have less than a 2% chance of finding that. And which would suggest to us that if we find 27 students with debt this low, there might be something unique about them. Perhaps they're finance majors. Perhaps they just took a financial planning course from the university. Whatever it may be, these students have done very well in keeping their debt low, better than we would expect by chance if we're using our conventional cutoff with an alpha of 0.05. And this, of course, what we've done here is a one-tailed test. And how do we know it's a one-tailed test? Because we've only looked at the area left. If we wanted this to be a two-tailed test, we would have to take this value and we would have to double it. So this would still be significant, but this would say, what's the probability of having uh, students with debt this extreme or far from the mean? So that would be on the high end or the low end. And in this case, we weren't really interested in this two-tailed value, the extreme. We were interested rather in just the one-tailed value because we wanted to know about the less than. Now, like we talked about, a lot of times in science, people will default to two-tailed tests, and we'll see that more and more as we go through the class. But right now, you really want to pay attention if they ask for a one-tailed or a two-tailed value. All right, so this is an example, and I just want to show you an interesting fact. If you use the calculation for the z-test all the time, where we use the formula for standard error, you would actually would never get it wrong. So you could do that for just one case. Why? Because what is the square root of one? The square root of one is one. So what is any value divided by one? That value. So if we were to use a standard error instead of the standard deviation here for this case of one student, And so now we would do this, divided by the square root of n, we still get the same value. So what this shows you is you could always use the equation for a z-test if you want a z-value, right? Uh, however, if you try to use the z-score equation when you need a z-test, you will get the wrong answer, right? Because if we did the mean and we did the population mean and the standard deviation and we didn't divide by the square root of n, we're going to go back to this value, and that is not the right answer because the probability of getting this in only one student is very different than finding this for the average of 25 students. Okay. Now, if you wanted to use my workbook for Excel that I developed, it is the one that looks like this that I posted in the class, and you would go back to, okay, our general instructions remind us here that it's to help us with a bunch of calculations. We can write in cells that look like this. Don't write in cells that look like that. All right, so if we come over here and we do a normal distribution calculator, you could do a z-test, but you need the data for the z-test. And we don't have all the data here. So what we have are just the values. So we need to use the distribution calculator. So if you use the distribution calculator, you can put in these values and solve it without typing the command into Excel because I've already pre-programmed it. So if we come over here where we want to turn an X score into a P value, how do I know? Because I have debt in dollars, which means it's an X, not a Z score, because it's in the original units. And I want to get a probability. So I put in the population mean, the standard deviation, the value of X, and there is my area left. That's the tail that I want. So this gives me the value if... I'm talking about the single case. 
But remember, if I'm talking about a case of 25, I have to use the standard error because the standard deviation of a sampling distribution is the standard error. So I would need to take 1120 divided by the square root of 25, and there is my p-value for the area left, doing it as a z-test using the normal distribution calculator that I built for you. All right, so these are the ways you could have solved this problem, either doing it in Excel yourself or using the calculator I developed.